Hey guys, how's it going? Kripari in here. Today I want to talk to you about Diablo 4, what I have learned, and I want to make this video to give you a bit of history of me with the Diablo genre, what you can expect out of Diablo 4, my experience, and before all of that, I want to give you guys a bit of history. So, I love the Diablo genre. I actually quit my job and became a streamer, full-time YouTuber as a result of Diablo 3 coming out. Bit more on that later. However, over the years, and it has been 11 years since I've done this now, thank you for supporting the channel and well, the stream and all that in that time, um, you know, we've evolved, we've done many different games, and at this point, you know, I generally play Hearthstone. Uh, now, there is some chance that I will play a lot of Diablo 4 when it releases, but I'm making this video uh, just as my opinion. Um, I think I can make this impartially, unbiased. Um, sure, there are some people that have been very nice to me on the Diablo community teams and all that, but it's not like a sponsored video or anything. Um, you know, I, I probably won't play Diablo 4 full-time, and I'm generally not too reserved to call stuff out as I see it, despite what bridges that might burn. It is what it is. So keep that in mind as you see this video. Now, uh, I just want to give you guys a quick history of me playing Diablo games, and then I'll tell you quickly what I think about um, uh, Diablo 4. And then I'll give you guys the full rundown. It's going to be a long video. I do these videos one take. Every video on this channel is done in one try in the intro. I'm pretty good at it. Uh, and there's no, like, second take, trust me. Uh, but I do have a few notes in this, in this one particular video because there's just so many topics to cover. I only wanted to make this video if I felt comfortable that I understood the game well enough. And I'm making this video after having played uh, about 40 hours of the three and a half ish weekend that we had to play the Barbarian, the Sorcerer, and the Rogue class in the first open early access beta. I don't know what they're calling it, whatever. So I do feel confident that I understand the game as I played it. Now, that might not be the game as it is currently in development. What we're playing might not be that recent to where they have developed the game in terms of actually releasing it two and a half months from now. But it's all we got, so my opinion is based on that. I played Diablo 1 when it came out. It was a wonderful experience. It really blew me away about the depth and what a video game could be. And it was the first game I actually played online. I have to imagine it was one of the first games you could play online as a result. And it was a really good game to play online. You could talk to other players. You could PvP them. It was a really mind-blowing experience for me. In a way, that really did change my life in a really big way. And somehow I end up here and you guys get to hear my opinions about Diablo and whatnot. Uh, I actually played Diablo 1 a lot. I played multiplayer a lot. I had the goal to get to max level, which was 50, and I was closing in on it, but I was, you know, a very young kid at the time, so I was telling people about how great I am online, and someone hacked my character and set it back to level 1. Hacks were very common in Diablo 1. I tried to do things legit just to prove myself that I could, but, you know, uh, that's not what ended up happening, I guess. Oh well. I ended up getting Diablo 1 for PlayStation 1, and at times I would play with my friends from middle school, and it was really a wonderful experience. Diablo 1, it's been decades since, and yet it is a game that people can play today and still enjoy parts of it. It's really unbelievable what they came up. Diablo 1 really defined the genre of ARPGs, in my opinion. Diablo 2 really perfected it. Diablo 2 has so many systems that were a slam dunk. The itemization of Diablo 2, the pacing, creating complex characters, simple to start, but really difficult to master. PvP was actually possibly the best PvP in any ARPG. It defined how a game can approach hardcore mode in a fair way. And so many of the early concepts of Diablo 2 actually were taken when development of Path of Exile. And in my opinion, Path of Exile is kind of the game to beat in the ARPG space. Right now, anyways. 
and Diablo 2 was really an absolute masterpiece. Honestly, Diablo 2 was the game that Diablo 3 was being compared against, not because it was just one number higher, it was the one being compared against because when Diablo 3 came out over a decade after Diablo 2, Diablo 2 still at that point in time was the benchmark for ARPGs. Today, I think, in my opinion, I think the benchmark is Path of Exile. So it is a little bit of a different story. Diablo 3 came out and Diablo 3, I feel, was one of the most ambitious projects Blizzard has ever taken on. It is a game that hyped me like no other. If you guys remember Jay Wilson talking about how their developers and no, their, their game testers tried to barely beat the game on a certain difficulty and then they doubled it. They doubled the numbers of that difficulty and that's the difficulty that you could expect in Diablo 4, uh, Diablo 3, I mean. And coming from a World of Warcraft Raider where balancing was actually pretty spot on in so many raids and somehow still is to this day. This was such a hype moment. This was so exciting. I know we meme about it. I know it's a very memeable moment, but as a, you know, as someone who had the goal of actually just taking on the game, knowing that there's a goal out there, knowing that there is an, a nearly impossible challenge ahead is a really exciting moment. Diablo 3 tried to change everything in significant ways. It tried to change mercenaries in different ways. It tried to change characters in, in very different ways. Everything scaled off of weapons. Everything multiplied everything. They tried to change that in a different way. They tried to revolutionize trading with the real money auction house. You know, Diablo 3 was an incredibly ambitious project. However, I think it released undercooked. Uh, a lot of the mechanics weren't fleshed out. A lot of the mechanics were left out of the release of the game. And a lot of these crazy ambitious ideas where they try to rework and redo an ARPG as people play it, well, a lot of them just didn't really work out. It's hard to say they were bad ideas because at the time I was really, you know, it really piqued my interest. You know, this this could be a really interesting thing, you know, uh, real money auction house. I mean, I don't know if I really want to pay real money for, for items, but, you know, it's never been done before. I want to see what it's going to come to. So Diablo 3 was a really ambitious project. Um, almost everything they did uh, didn't work out better than Diablo 2 in my opinion. And one of the worst things in Diablo 3 was the item scaling, where everything multiplied everything, your weapon damage had like a crazy multiplier, and you had crazy multipliers from crit damage, skill damage, and now we have sets that have like 60,000% increased damage to certain skills. You know, it's... If you have itemization at that level, and you're doing literally quintillion damage, you're gonna have problems, and Diablo 3 has always struggled to deal with those problems because the core of the game was just really hard to work with. Diablo 4. So, you've been watching a few minutes of the video. I'm just gonna hit you guys with it. What do I think Diablo 4 is? How good is Diablo 4? Out of 10, Crip, tell us. Well, if what we were playing this last weekend is where they currently are with development, more or less. Knowing that the game is going to be fully released for console and PC and whatever else in two and a half months from now, I think the game will launch and be about six stars out of ten. That's kind of where I would rate it. Now, with that said, I think it's important to note that a lot of that comes from the fact that I think a lot of mechanics in this game just need a little bit of work, but it needs to be very smart work. Like, there's a lot of mechanics that are really rough, kind of unfinished, I would say, have serious problems, and some of them can be fixed fairly easily, and some require quite clever solutions that I don't even have right now. And I think all of that, because the overall system of Diablo 4 is complex, will take some time. And I certainly think it's going to take way more than two and a half months to get the game to that point where it is a masterpiece. And I do think that in the very positive case, where this development cycle continues on after the game's release, I think like a year from its release, like the third, maybe second season, because it is going to be launching with seasons, 
Um, I think it could be like a 9 out of 10, maybe 9.5 out of 10 game. I can kind of understand the goals that the game tries to hit. I can kind of understand where it's coming from. Um, but I don't think it's quite there, and it would really surprise me if it gets there in the time period of two and a half months. But, you know what? Maybe maybe they're way, ahead of, way more ahead in development than the beta that we're playing, or maybe they're really going to go ham and knock it out of the park in the coming weeks. But I just wouldn't bet on it, and I want to be straight with you guys. Now, we're going to head into character highlight. So I played like 40 hours. The first thing I did is I leveled each of the three playable classes to level 25. This is my most successful one. And I want to give you guys this highlight because it will act as something that you can see and understand in practice. How does this game work? How does a character come together? What is happening on the screen? So we'll just load into this dungeon here. This is a dungeon that you know I kind of like particularly. And I'll show you how my build works, more or less. The build revolves largely around the skill Hydra. It is a skill you will be familiar with if you've played Diablo 2 or Diablo 3, for example. You put a guy down, four heads. The fourth head only spawns if I have nearly full health. And to maintain that, and a number of other reasons, I protect my life with barriers. Barriers are kind of like temporary life pools. So I put Hydras down. The Hydras attack stuff, and it works pretty well. And as you will notice, they drop rare items, they drop blue items. And the Hydras, they explode when they get hit. And that's because of the sorcerer-specific mechanic um, where you can turn skills into passives. Now, they, they're not like skills that are just used passively. They're used in individual ways, and it's a really interesting system, as I'll show you pretty soon. The characters... Uh, sorry, the, the monsters around are going to be scaling with my level. So it is kind of what you expect. The character has a large array of defensive cooldowns. And the character doesn't really use mana. Mana regenerates. I could be casting more abilities to spend my mana. But as you'll see through the rest of the character, it doesn't really make sense to do that. The two, um, the two Hydras that I'm putting down, well, they really just do enough work. Hey, look at that. We got two legendaries. Hooray. Okay. Let's just leave the dungeon. It'll port me out. And I will show you how the character works in practice. So, in terms of the character's abilities, which is where we're going to start, we have this form of skill tree. You have to get two points in this part of the tree in order to unlock this part of the tree. Then, I think it's like five points later, you unlock this part, then like three to five points later, this part, and so on. It's something like that. There is a Paragon system that unlocks at level 50, apparently. We don't have a lot of details about that, but we'll go into that as we talk about the pros and cons later on. So you have to get a starting skill. The starting skills uh, don't cost any mana, and they're generally fairly weak. I get Fire, Firebolt and Arclash. I max out Fireball, and I'll explain in a second why I do that, which unlocks the ne next set. And I have a lot of defensive abilities, but I don't actually have these specced in. You can see Rank 1, Item Contribution 1. That's because my amulet has plus 1 rank to all Conjuration skills and plus 1 rank to all Defensive skills. So you can tell items are really powerful and they actually shape how you build your character. So you're not going to see a situation where use this build. There's always going to be some variations at least based on the items that you have acquired because, you know, getting all the defensive skills for free, I don't have to put a single point in one of them, I can move on to the next cluster. Now, the later clusters also have some passives. For example, Glass Cannon, you deal 12% increased damage, but you take 6% more damage. That's a pretty basic one. There's a lot of basic ones, but as you go further down the tree, they get a bit more complicated. We max out Hydra. We have rank 8 Hydra. Rank 5 is the most you can put in by just attributing points to the skill tree from levels and whatnot. 
and you can increase the rank through items. In terms of damage scaling, you are looking at a 10% increase in damage per level. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, or 8. It seems to be 10% every level compounded. And that is not a lot, but it is nevertheless somewhat significant. Um, I actually don't have any of those, but most of my damage is fire, so I have the pyromancy when you're healthy. It defines healthy as over 80 through the advanced tooltip. Some areas you can only pick one skill. The ultimate ones, you can only pick one skill, so I pick deep freeze. Just have a quick look at the skills. So flame shield can break crowd control, and it gives me a two-second immunity period. You can see this is the unstoppable and the immune. I have Ice Armor, which just gives me a massive barrier and allows me to break a few things. The Hydra skill, as I highlighted in the instance. Deep Freeze is the ultimate. It gives me complete immunity for four seconds. I stand still freeze myself, but this actually does a lot of damage. And it's a very good skill to use on bosses offensively because the boss stands still trying to attack you uh, and, well, it doesn't do a very good job at that. But it stands still, so your Hydras never miss. I have Ice Blades. Ice Blades are a conjuration, and I only really use them to proc the vulnerable debuff. It's a pretty common debuff, but it's not that common for Sorcerer, so getting 20% increased damage when those do a few hits is very nice. And I have Teleport, which can once again be used while crowd control to break crowd control. The main advantage with Hydra is that it does quite a bit of damage, but it's mostly single target. You can place it far away. And effectively, because of this mechanic, you have an invincible totem-like creation. You can actually strike enemies two screens away, because the Hydra actually hits quite far. Each class in Diablo 4 has its own mechanic that is individual to that class. For Sorcerer, it is the enchantment system. So these are the skills, and these are the enchantments here. You have one enchantment that unlocks after doing a quest at level 15, and you have a second one that unlocks when you do a quest at level 30. Now, you can change your enchantment even in combat, so it's, it's a very fluid system, but you need to have a point in the skill, or you need to get the skill from an item in order to do this. Each skill has a very unique enchantment effect. One of the ones that I use for this character, if, I want, if I'm doing like a boss, is Firebolt. Direct damage from skills applies up to an additional 23% burning damage over 8 seconds. Since Hydra attacks individually, and this is not a lucky hit, this actually increases the damage of my Hydra, though over 8 seconds, by about 40 to 50%. So it's a massive single target boost for very tanky bosses like world bosses. Typically, though, I use the Fireball enchantment effect, and you can see it at the bottom there. You can see it here, too. Fireball enchantment. When you kill an enemy, they explode in a fireball for 50% of its damage. So that means that I basically have a corpse explosion-like effect, which for those of you that have played Path of Exile, you know is quite good. And because it uses the damage of the fireball, unlike the firebolt one, for example, in some cases it will use the skills, in some cases it won't use the skill. I actually want to max out Fireball because I want the Fireball on kill to do as much damage as possible. And the reason is that Hydra, while it does a lot of single target damage, it tends to kind of get stuck by attacking multiple and random targets around it. It's actually a pretty awful area of effect skill. So the build quite heavily relies on some kind of corpse explosion mechanic like Fireball. It doesn't actually explode the corpses, but you know what I mean. Now, defensively, we have uh, largely incorporated through items. One of the first items that I got, and you can see in orange there, is deal 64% increased damage while you have a barrier active. There is an aspect here. 
using a cooldown grants 30% of your maximum life as a barrier for 5 seconds. That's why I'm using so many skills that seem kind of overlapping, too many defensive cooldowns and all that. I'm really just using them because they have cooldowns so I can have a barrier on my character all the time. There's also this skill where you gain 5% damage reduction against elites. It's also against bosses and players, by the way. This specific one, not the elite keyword, it's just not labeled properly. If you haven't taken damage from one, up to 50%. This only goes down, and you can see it here that I have 50 stacks, it only drops if I take life damage. So the goal of this character is to always have barriers up to essentially take half damage from the only real like enemies that deal meaningful damage to me, and to have a consistent 64% more damage through the weapon. A quick look through the rest of my gear. I have plus two Hydra on helmet uh, with, it's an immune bubble, so if I ever drop below 80, I get an immune bubble for five seconds. That like never happens though. Damaging an elite gives me a barrier, so that's kind of like another thing to proc pretty easily. This gives me an extra Hydra. Normally you can only cast one Hydra, but with that item it reduces the duration, but you can get two. It, effect it effectively doubles my DPS with this build, but if you incorporate other skills besides Hydra, which you absolutely can in a Hydra build, it's not exactly doubling your DPS. Armor, if you hit stuff with two Hydras, I'm often over 60 stacks, up to 80 stacks if it's a long-standing stationary target. The boots don't have anything impressive, but I really like the evade grants movement speed. So it has an evade mechanic. Having movement speed after it is really nice because it does feel like it takes forever to get around. The amulet has plus one all conjuration and plus one defensive skills, which is an incredibly powerful uh, attribute to have. You might use these items long after their you know, uh, original find just because of the skill contribution in some cases. And uh, I get uh, increased damage based on how much primary resource I have when they're cast. And because Hydra is the only one that uses resource and sorcerers regenerate it quickly, well, that's going to be full buff a lot of the time. Uh, this just has good stats and deal increased damage for each second you stand still. You can see my attack power is there. If I move, I lose the buff completely. And if I wait a few seconds, it goes back up. But interestingly enough, if I teleport, it is not counting as moving, so it retains the buff in its entirety. And this is actually a very big deal on bosses. So this character is a defense monster because I have almost entirely defensive abilities. It is an offense monster. It is a clear speed monster, and it is pretty easy to play. In terms of builds, if this was a PoE build, this would be a 10 out of 10 in every category build, which is why I will almost certainly be playing um, Sorcerer on launch. Uh, if not this build, I feel like the enchantment system and the very complex parts of it uh, allow for almost certainly some game-breaking mechanics to, you know, go through the cracks. And as I will start to talk about, there are a lot of cracks. Now, this part of the video, I want to talk about the good things about the game, the bad things about the game, just so you guys can understand with full clarity why I think so, why some other people might have this opinion, because not everyone is good at explaining and giving evidence for their opinions. So, one of the best things about Diablo 4 is the graphics. I don't even have my graphics maxed out, because I actually blue screened, I guess because it's a beta. But you can see the shadows are super dynamic. Every, you know, the snow, the, the, the little leaves are moving, the fire, it has smoke. You can see it's like a picturesque game. It's unbelievable detail. When you're zoomed out like this, you take it for granted. If you don't have good eyesight, you're certainly going to take it for granted. But in terms of overall details, visually speaking, the world environment, the graphics, the theming, it is unbelievably good. I would say it is, I don't play every game that releases, but it is certainly the best crafted visual game in terms of the gameplay. Forget the cutscenes, I don't care about the cutscenes. In terms of the gameplay that I have ever seen, okay? I think it is that good. Another good thing is combat. Combat is crisp. When you use a skill, it uses the skill. 
that's pretty nice. The one thing I have with skills is you can only have six skills on your bars, probably to accommodate console players, and I can tell you for a fact that that sucks. Okay, if you want to think about it in a different way, you can actually bind more skills in Diablo 2, okay, which is, I believe, a 23-year-old game right now, than you can in this game. And obviously, that is done because they want to release a multi-platform game, which, as someone who doesn't care that they release a multi-platform game, is a bit unfortunate. But nevertheless, the combat is great. It's not a case where, you know, you think you dodged it, but you didn't dodge it. There's only one thing that's a bit weird. There's a lot of crowd control effects. And if you use your dodge to try to dodge a crowd control effect, but you just mistime it and it hits you right after you come out of the, like the stun or whatever, then it just burns your dodge in the direction you initially cast it. But if that's like five seconds later, you might actually be killing off your character and burning your dodge. So, you know, again, a little bit of details. As I mentioned early on, this game is very rough around the edges, but I can see that most aspects of combat are really well done and they feel very good. The other aspect is character depth. I talked about my character. I showed, you know, all these different things. And um, there is so much more here than you might realize. And I think it's important for me to go over this in some detail. So there's going to be five classes. Each class has its own subset mechanic, which is incredibly complicated. I highlighted a build, but who knows what the best ability is? When we have two abilities, who knows what the best two abilities are? You know, will I continue using Fireball? I don't know. I might use Fireball to stack separate burns and to get a lot of free firewalls, in which case I have to put points in firewalls. But again, some people don't realize this is not a skill tree where you just get everything you want. Okay, at level 50, we're going to get something with Paragons, and we'll go into that in a second. It feels to me like the skill tree is going to be very limiting. You're going to want to get everything, but you can't get everything. And that's when it gets interesting. That's when the decisions start to really matter. In terms of the item-based stuff, you can see some items have three because they're actually rares that I converted into legendaries. If you find a legendary that... Oh, wow, that's a really good drop. So this legendary that just dropped while I was playing earlier... It has the modifier that I actually have on my chest. On my chest, it's imprinted. Now, this one, based on its item level, has a maximum roll. 315 to 630. Okay. That's unbelievable. Uh, that's actually kind of lucky. Now, this item, its actual stats on itself, they're not very good. I don't care about thorns. I don't care that much about the two resists. I get lots of resistance because it scales intelligence. Okay. But the legendary ability, I can take that to the occultist and make it into an item. In fact, the one on my pants, I have made into an item. I can then take a piece of gear. Let's say this chest had a terrible ability, but it had really good stats. I can then take that piece and put the ability that I extracted from another legendary into it changing its legendary ability. This system is quite deep. It's quite deep because you're going to find many types of items that are going to be useful to you. In terms of rares, rares have three stats. People say they're going to have five at the end game. I don't know. All I know is what's in front of me. Every rare I found had three stats on it. Every legendary had four stats on it. You can re-roll one stat. It's pretty expensive to do so to try to perfect the item, and it gets more expensive each time you do that. To re-roll a stat on a legendary item is crazy expensive. To re-roll a stat on a rare item is not that expensive at all. So getting a rare with three perfect stats that you then imprint a legendary ability converting into legendary, it's only going to have three stats, but it's quite easy to have three of the best stats that you're looking for. It is incredibly hard to find a legendary with four of the stats that you're looking for. So the item system is a lot deeper than people realize. The aspects, some of them can only be found on items, but some of them are found as dungeon rewards. 
there are different categories to them and I'll explain why this is relevant. There's utility which goes on a bunch of stuff but generally you do that on boots or something. There's resource which is only rings but again these are usually not super powerful. Mobility, amulet and boots. You'll see that Amulets can be almost everything. The defensive ones are really strong and the offensive ones are really strong. And you can see that the amulet is shared between the two. Now, it's a little bit more complicated than that. In effect, there are certain multipliers with their legendary powers that come into play. For example, this here can uh, show up on random legendaries that I find as gloves, amulets, rings, or one-handed or two-handed weapons. I extract it, and then I can choose where I want to put it. But if I put it in a two-handed weapon, it gets double the bonus. So I really need to be careful which ability I want effectively doubled on my character. The amulet can have all but the ring exclusive resource ones, which again, aren't that really important. The amulet can have both offense or defense. So the amulet kind of becomes the flexible slot where it really tips the scale. Do you want a more offensive character or do you want a more defensive character overall? And again, the amulet has the power increased by 50% as well. So it's not just one more slot, it's 1.5 slots. And that is a pretty big deal. Now, um, I've crafted a pretty powerful build here, but we've left out a pretty big part of it. What are Paragon levels? Well, the short answer is that we don't know. But I found this little article that shows some of the, you know, design. These are Paragon boards, and as you can see from the edges here, this is apparently from December 2021, so a long time ago, not finals, from one of their blog posts, I believe. I believe you link these up. So there's probably some strategies in, one, which Paragon boards you're actually going to select. I don't even know how you find them, how you modify them, how you position them and link them up with one another. Do you want this stuff here? Do you want that stuff there? Do you want that stuff there? Like these have different colors, so I imagine they, they do different things. And then they have a different UI here, but it looks, it, the core concepts seem the same. And this. People that I've seen review Diablo 4 talk about how it's a more accessible game than Path of Exile. It's, you know, it's, it's a much easier and more approachable game. But then I look at these Paragon boards, and again, this, this article is from like August 2022. So, you know, maybe this means nothing, but what I see is three different UIs of the same concept. And that concept is an incredibly deep and complicated layer on top of an already fairly deep and complicated layer for the rest of your character. So the character depth in Diablo 4 I think is going to take some people by surprise. I think people really don't understand that this game is a lot deeper, a lot more PoE-like in character design than people think. Now, everything that I just mentioned, the skills, the items, the aspects, all that kind of stuff. Another thing that's really good about Diablo 4 is the gold. It is a level 25 experience. It might mean absolutely nothing, but it seems like you always want a little bit more gold than you have, but not that much more. It feels like gold is valuable in the game, at least in the beta that we have, and it is not at all meaningless. Upgrading gear, changing aspects around, all that kind of stuff, it seems like gold actually has a very thoughtful value that seems to scale as your character does, which is really cool and I think is typically a pretty ambitious goal to have in a game like this one. Almost always the main currency of a game that's easy to find like gold quickly becomes worthless or the gold sinks are ones that just go away after a while. Again, it's a beta low-level experience, but it certainly seems like the gold spending in the game is very balanced and has a lot of thought behind it to get it to this point. Now we'll get to the bad stuff. So the UI is, I think, one of the weakest things about the game. The trade menu is like worse than like Diablo 2. 
items have scrolls, like I have to scroll down to see the rest of the item. In some cases, especially for weapons on like barbarians, you can't even see the legendary power unless you hover over the item and scroll down. You can't see the items if you hover over them quickly because there's some kind of like transparency transition. And you're like, who cares, Crip? Well, I'm gonna, if I clear this dungeon, I'm going to have nearly a full inventory of rare and legendary items. And as I just talked about, rare items have value. I actually really want to know which rare items I'm going to find that have not even three stats I'm looking for, two stats that I'm looking for. I actually need to look at the items pretty quickly because I don't want to spend hours looking at items after I do a dungeon. So it, it's, it's really not good, okay? There's no map overlay. It's this tiny thing. You can't really zoom that in or out, so you have to use the general map key. When you have the map key up, you can't see your health bar on your character. You can't see your character in any way. This map screen is horrible. If you have two different zones of quests that you have to go to and you track one, they're the same color, so you don't even know which quest you're targeting and where, where you need to go with that. For a game as visually stunning as this, the UI is surprisingly weak. Um, I am not at all pleased with the UI in this game. I think it needs a lot of work. The other aspect is the game costs a lot of money. A lot of money. Uh, I'm not going to get into all that kind of stuff, but as a Canadian, I believe the cheapest I can buy the game for is like... $79, like $80. It's almost the same US currency, if you're curious. Um, but, you know, I haven't been playing Diablo for like 30 years to play four days after some people. So, with like the premium version of the game, which costs, I think, $110 or $120, I get to play four days early on the actual release, and I get a bunch of cosmetics, and I get the battle pass. And if I pay $130, I get all of that, some other cosmetics, and 20 accelerated levels in the battle pass. Now, they've been pretty clear, and they've said that the battle pass has um, only cosmetic-type stuff, but... Yeah, I don't really know if that is going to turn out to be the case 100%. In one post, again, fairly early on, so maybe it's not true anymore, they said there's going to be XP potions in the free part of the battle pass. But if I'm getting 20 levels, I don't know. Now, they haven't said anything about that in quite a long while, so maybe that's not even the case. You can craft XP potions, so with like nothing, it's like almost not, it's like 5% XP, but you know, you can. So maybe, maybe just getting one more XP potion in the battle class is effectively meaningless. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Um, it's tough to say, but overall, they're really milking this for money, okay? B Blizzard's a public company. They're worth like $70 billion. Microsoft wants to buy them. This is going to be a for-profit game. It might not be a pay-to-win game, but it is going to be a for-profit game. Okay, people criticize like Lost Ark because it had like early access, but Lost Ark, when it came out, it was free for everyone. So yeah, there is that. If this game is going to be successful, it's going to have seasons. I don't imagine you're going to buy seasons, but if this game is going to be that successful, it's going to have expansions. And let me tell you, whatever you're paying for the game now. You're probably paying about that much for any expansions that Diablo 4 is going to have. And as a Canadian video gamer on the internet, like myself, it doesn't really bother me that I'm paying $100 to play this game. But, understandably, for people around the world, that is not even close to the same. So, yeah, that actually does really suck. Uh, one other part that I think is extremely weak and really needs to be addressed immediately is dungeon mechanics. The end game, as far as we know, as far as they've talked about it, has to do with Nightmare Sigils, which is effectively upgrading the dungeons that you already run as you're playing through the campaign with like modifiers, very much like maps in Path of Exile. You make them harder, they get like higher level mobs and all that, and you get better loot or something. I would imagine anyway, I, I, would, I would hope so. Now, what that essentially means is that you're going to be running the dungeons 
that you're kind of running right now just with higher difficulties, maybe significantly higher difficulties. While the difficulty might be good and all, the actual mechanics in the dungeons are horrible. They are not fun. And if it is the core of the endgame of Diablo 4, we don't know if that's 100%, but I think it might be based on what we've seen, and I'll give you evidence for that. That's very concerning. It's very concerning because there are mechanics like kill all the monsters before you can get to the boss. All the monsters. We're not talking about Den of Evil here, okay? Where you have a character with no abilities that you really need to kill any monster you find in your way to get a few levels for you to actually have a character, and Den of Evil has like 35 monsters in it, including one at the end that usually drops rare and magical items, okay? No, we're talking about full-on dungeons that have like 300 monsters, in some cases that spawn other monsters as part of their abilities, and you need to kill every single one until you can access the boss. I hate that. And it's not just a preference. You might think, it's like, oh, you know what, Crip? I like Den of Evil. That's great. That's good for you. Here's the thing about that. We're talking about likely the end game content. These are not going to be easy mobs in the end game content, I imagine. Like Diablo 3 is not really easy in the end game. You play it at your own difficulty level, right? So who knows? It might be something like that. So what if you kill 295 monsters and then you encounter a rare that you can't kill? You know what you're going to do? You're going to leave the dungeon. And then you're going to remember this video and you're going to remember that Crip told you that the mechanic sucks. That mechanic sucks. There's a colossal difference between killing every monster in a 300 monster dungeon and killing 95% of them. I don't know why a system of just killing 95%, why is that not good enough? Just have us kill most of them to proceed in the dungeon. A lot of dungeon mechanics are like, they have like two pedestals. I think one of the dungeons has three pedestals. And you have to go in different corners of the dungeon to kill a mob or just retrieve an item off a shelf. And then you take that item and you put it back on the pedestal. The item is kind of on your character. Actually, you can usually see it on your character, which is a really cool thing, going back to the amazing graphics and image-based design in the game. But you can't hold more than one of these items. So what often happens is you backtrack the entire dungeon more than once over, more than twice over in some cases. And each time you interact with an object, it is interruptible. And it takes like five, six, seven, eight. It takes like many seconds. It takes like eight seconds to pick up a jewel from a guy that you killed. And it takes eight seconds to put the jewel on the pedestal, okay? You're like, crypt. Well, who cares, right? In this game, there's ore. Do you know how long it takes to mine ore? Zero seconds, okay? It takes zero seconds to extract metal from a rock in the ground when you're running around the world and it takes you eight seconds to drop a jewel on a pedestal that can be interrupted by any form of damage okay and it gets even worse in one case you have to click on two levers and i have a really hard time actually seeing where the levers are and if you go to the levers there's like traps under them so you're just like trying to time traps to click on like a seven second lever to open the door to the boss it's like what is that how is this fun people were telling me in chat that those those traps actually did a lot of damage one guy lost his character to trap damage from trying to click on a lever i can tell you that is not going to be a fun experience for hardcore characters okay the bosses themselves the bosses are heavily repeated in the beta that might just be the beta okay I hope that is just the beta. Uh, there's not that many monster types from my experience. There's a massive overworld and all that, but it's actually not that many monster types. The abilities the monsters have are often not very interesting. One of the abilities, it binds you and you can't move your character for like eight seconds while it's dealing damage to you. Not all characters have crowd control breaks like sorcerers do, okay? Uh, that's really crappy. Like, I don't know. I didn't like that.
In general, I've also felt that there's almost no regard for melee on these encounters. And I've kind of been saying that Barbarian is bad. Now, we only have up to level 25. And of course, if you grind like crazy and have a completely decked out character level 25, which you will not do leveling up, by the way, well, yeah, okay, you might have a pretty easy experience playing Barbarian. But the boss fights are not at all melee friendly. Barbarian has Fury, which unlike every other character in the game, their resource goes down if they're not in combat, regenerating it through their generators. So with a Barbarian, you have to deal with the boss mechanics that are very anti-melee, attack to generate fury, and then use that fury to use and launch your biggest attacks. The other characters, they just use their attacks from range, and they don't have to generate their resource. What does that mean? I feel like the characters are actually more or less in the same ballpark. We'll talk about that in a second. In terms of like target dummy DPS. Stationary, no reaction target dummy DPS. But if you consider the real world example in Diablo 4, some of these boss fights have like, at best case, 50% DPS uptime because you just can't be near the boss. You can't do anything other than run with your character. A class like a sorcerer, where the mana is regenerating while you're running, you actually lose less than half your damage if you have 50% damage uptime because you can actually use heavier mana spenders in the window where you can do damage. A barbarian that loses their primary resource while they're not gaining it from using generators actually loses more than half their damage. So while, again, at level 25, the ballpark damage is more or less in the same uh, ballpark, let's say, um, the the real damage that you end up doing on the encounters while doing the mechanics, the Barbarian falls off a cliff, and not just in terms of numbers, it's just a miserable experience chasing monsters that run away from you, dealing with monsters teleporting away from you, deciding on whether you're going to die in the puddle, the boss constantly spawns directly under it, and then reconsidering why you're not playing a class that has an ability that can be used from like three pixels away from the boss, right? So, yes. The melee viability is very poor, and in the beta, it's especially true for Barbarian. I do want to add a little bit here that this has a little bit of a detail to it. The mechanics that I mentioned in the game here, so we talked about, like, you know, weapons have, like, a doubling of the effect if they're two-handed weapons. The Barbarian thing, you know, Barbarian doesn't get free passives from their skills like the Sorcerer does. The Barbarian gets an arsenal system where they always use specific weapons for specific skills. And they end up using two two-handed weapons and two one-handed weapons. Now, if we look at the aspect configurator, the one-handed weapons are treated as if like they have one slot, but the two-handed is kind of like a double slot. So effectively, a barbarian has three more item slots worth of stats and legendary abilities. And because probably these are all multiplier effects, I would bet that even though it will take longer to actually gear out a barbarian, there's far more abusive multipliers and combos that you can work with as a barbarian. The depth and like the absolute peak maximum performance of barbarian probably is not realized in, in this beta whatsoever as a result of that. And it does make for potentially the case that barbarians might do more damage than the other classes at high level. However, what I argue is that the game mechanics are so stacked against, you know, gritty melee combat that unless Barbarian does like five times the damage of a Sorcerer, a Sorcerer is still going to be better off just playing this game. And that kind of really sucks. Another big con is Hardcore. Now, a lot of people are like, hey, Crip, are you going to play Hardcore? Are you going to World First? First of all, I don't know what there is to World First. What am I going to World First? like max level or something? Is that even a challenge? The campaign? Is that even a challenge? You know, this isn't Jay Wilson coming out and telling us that it's the hardest game they ever made, then they doubled it. You know, if they say that, then yeah, then that gets me really excited. And then yes, 
But nothing like that has been said. Nothing ambitious has been said about this game, in my opinion. Nothing has suggested that there is world-firstable content from what I have heard so far, and that might change in the future. But, yeah. When Diablo 3 came out, I didn't play hardcore. I played softcore to learn the game, to have an idea if it can and is worth attempting on hardcore. Then we decided that it was, then we did it. In this game, I don't know, maybe I'll play hardcore, but I'm certainly not starting hardcore. One part of hardcore that, again, in the beta, and again, it's not that hard to fix, but it does need to be fixed. Diablo 4 has no grace period. When you go in a dungeon, there's no grace period zoning in. When you come out of a dungeon, there's no grace period zoning out. Not only are there regularly mobs at the entrances of both the inside and overworld of a dungeon, but it's an open world. Other players can drag dangerous monsters literally on top of you as your hard drive struggles to load into the overworld. Now, forget your hard drive. You want to play this game on release? This, this game had issues in the first beta with extremely limited people actually trying to play it. I would say that you are crazy if you're going to even attempt to play hardcore in the first week of the game. The, the chance that you die to zoning or server crashes or server lag and instability are much higher than the best case you might even imagine. I think, there, I think your character is going gonna, is gonna to die the most unfair way possible. And you don't want to be that guy, you know? So unless they have grace periods and significant account for them, hardcore is not really viable in my opinion. Another aspect is the general balance of things. There are so many skills and so many aspects to them. You know what? I'll give you another example. It feels like balance is not finely tuned. Okay? Like, look at this. Your core skills deal 4% increased damage when cast above 50 mana. Right? To constantly cast core skills and be over 50 mana is really hard to do. It's second in line after additional mana. Three additional mana? Really? Core skills are generally not even the best skills. You can get 3% damage or even, what is that, 6% damage for one point. This is four on one core skill. If you level a core skill up one level, it gains 10% damage. So in a realistic case, you'd have to be using like three simultaneous core skills on a regular rotation for this to maybe be worth it, and you need to watch your mana while you're doing it. It's just like, yeah, I think, I think they, they didn't really like very finely tune the numbers on these things. And a lot of people have kind of realized that, you know, playing the first few levels of, of Sork and Rogue and Barb, some of the stuff just feels so off. So when you have the level of complexity of the character design and the item system that I hope I've convinced you of, when you stack that up to all the crazy possibilities we'll probably experience in the Paragon system, we have a system that has an unbelievably large amount of variables. It's a case where I don't think there is any like small group of testers that could really iron out the game. What's going to happen is this. The game's going to come out and the community is going to bounce ideas off each other, work together, and some people are going to figure out these combinations, these item builds, these character builds that are not going to do like 50% more damage than others. They're going to do like 100 times more damage than others. And even though there's this really rich sense of, you know, the game overall, I feel like because the values are not quite finely tuned and a bit all over the place, there is going to be like one or two builds that's going to be vastly superior for every class. And eventually everyone is going to spec into it, which is a bit of a shame. Complex systems require really finely tuned management of the values. And I'm not really seeing that in this department. Another part is bosses, notably world bosses. So world bosses work this way. 12 players in the area basically challenge the world boss. So you're like, hey, Crypta seems okay. 
world bosses are pretty epic. They're pretty cool. A lot of people said that in the beta, it was the highlight of their gameplay. And you know what? I think there are points to agree with that, other than the fact that barbarians really just died a lot. Uh, and I, I never died on the world boss. It's super easy. Two screens away. Hydra, 3,000 damage per second. Literally two screens away from the boss. Not a single mechanic could even reach me. And uh, like in one case, I, I did the world boss while eating, while playing Battlegrounds. 3,000 DPS. <laughs> okay. So, yes, it is extremely unfair to some classes. But it's more unfair and has a tragic design flaw. Parties in Diablo 4 are four people. And there's no ways to extend that. So if you want to do a world boss, you at most can get three of your most powerful friends, you bring your most powerful character, and you go to the world boss area, the timer ticks down, and you have like eight random people around. If those eight random people around are like low-level people who don't know how to do the fight, well, obviously Blizzard's going to account for that. So, unless there is a system for, like, maybe linking three groups, or a larger group, or like a raid group, or a battle group, which does not exist in the beta anyway, I will say with confidence there is zero chance that world bosses are aspirational content in Diablo 4. I think world bosses effectively force you into a looking for raid system like in world of warcraft and they're not going to make the hardest system when two-thirds of the challengers of a world boss are literally random so that is a terrible mechanic there's been a lot of mechanics that don't work very well in terms of the shared overworld. I get what they're trying to do. They're trying to have everyone do any part of it that they want, which is kind of like a sense of freedom. But there is a lot of issues with it. This problem, I think, will remain with the game. This is one of those problems that is very heavy to balance, very heavy to move around, very, very difficult to change because it's so core to the game. So I think it will always plague Diablo 4. And I'm talking about the forced multiplayer level scaling party system. What happens is you're going to go in whatever zone it is, Act 1 is, and you're going to do it on like a level 3 character. You're going to notice that your level 3 character one shots the bears and then you're going to notice that like a level 40 character is beside you and he's actually struggling with the bears he kills them in like three hits even though he's using like stronger abilities you're going to have cases where a level three character is going to be beside a level 40 character and the level three character is going to be stronger in that zone than the level 40 character all the mobs scale with your level simultaneously. It's a very complex system, and that's why I don't think it will change. I don't think it will be scrapped because it's too core to the actual game. But basically what happens is the monsters just scale to your level. And you might be thinking, hey, that's okay. Here's one of the main consequences. I don't want to take up this video. I could probably talk 30 minutes on this subject. But the main consequence is that when you level up, you are always weaker, okay? Unless you just unlock, like, your ultimate ability, except for, like, three or four levels where you, like, unlock the next tier of abilities as you're leveling. Unless that happens, when you level up, the instant you level up, your character will always get weaker. Because one point on the skill tree at most is 10% damage, and my hands-on understanding is that the monsters gain more than 10% health. So how does your character get stronger? Well, oftentimes it doesn't, okay? You're kind of just trying to keep up with the level scaling. It's not like a traditional, you know, Diablo 2 style game where, oh, this zone is too hard, I'll just go to a lower, lower level zone. There is no lower level zone. You can like drop the difficulty of the world and probably get like crappy drops in experience. Or you can just, I don't know, try to fight through it anyway. I personally hate that. I think it's a terrible system. It, it has its advantages because it's very inclusive, but I think it just doesn't feel good as the character. So how do you get stronger? Well, 
most of the power that you're going to gain as you play the game is going to come from items. So if you're playing through the game and you find like a legendary item, especially one with an ability you didn't have that is very good for your class and character, your, your power level is going to go up a lot in some cases. But then you're going to level up and your power level is going to drop. And then it's going to drop again after another level. It's going to drop again after another level. But then you find another item, you know? So it feels very weird. I don't, like, hate it, but I don't like it. And I do think it is a very rigid base system in the game that is going to cause a lot of problems over time. And yeah, the forced multiplayer thing, too. Uh, it might be pretty annoying. I think you're going to see a lot of griefing. Again, another reason why I wouldn't really play hardcore. Uh, itemization. Itemization is a bit too simple uh, in terms of, like, the item level system. I wish there was more complexities, and in some cases there are too far of complexities. Like if, if we just quickly go through the system here, it's like, okay, what do we got here? Basic skill damage, vulnerable damage, damage to crack control enemies, core skill damage. That's not too bad, that's not too bad. But you're going to see some things like, oh by the way, here's another bad one for the UI. You want to see actual, actually what your stats are? You have to click on materials and stats, which always defaults to plants. And then you have to click this button, which shows your gold and your active buffs. And then you have to scroll down. So things like overpower chance. You have a 3% chance to do like a crazy large hit and it's based off of your life plus fortify plus the overpowered damage bonus. And on multi-hit skills, it overpowered damages every single hit of the skills. So with fast hitting, uh, low damage skills, that multi-hit is incredibly good. So you can stack health and even though it's 3% chance, you're going to do like no damage, no damage, no damage. But then every 10th or 30th hit, you're going to do like... 30 times damage. It's, like, it's so confusing to really get a grasp for some of these mechanics. But in other cases, the itemization is like uh, item power. What is item power? Well, an item has an item power. It's kind of like an item level. But it doesn't work like item level in Diablo 2 or Diablo 3 or Path of Exile. It seems like, and again, it's the bit, but it seems like if an item of a turn item power drops, it's like an item level. But the stats that spawn on the item are always of that item level. What does that mean? So you could have like like three int on boots if they're like level three or something like that. I don't know, it's just an example. But if you find item level 373 boots, it's always going to be a range of 11 to 18, as you can see on the item. Always. You're never going to have a stat higher than 18 or lower than 11. It's always the top bracket of stats. You might be thinking, hey, that's pretty good. That means items are generally pretty good. Yes, items are generally pretty good. And that is a good thing in a way, but the item level scales with your level. So if you find those perfect gloves with the perfect stats, with the perfect imprinted mod of additional Hydra, and then you fast forward three levels, yeah, you need to find that exact same item again with the exact same stats, with the exact same power or imprinted power, because it's going to have marginally more stats. I feel like this game is going to be constantly finding the same items you already have as you level. Uh, and that's only really solved by having an extremely fast and cheap journey to maximum level, which honestly, I also hate. I really like the idea of grinding out levels and having that time spent in the game be meaningful. So that is kind of a mess. And one of the hardest things to manage in ARPGs, because all these systems rarely work out in one another, is PvP. That quick little 10 bit of overpower should give you some idea about what PvP might be like. I played a rogue and I used flurry, which is a good skill to stack overpower. Now, because it hits like 10 times, I think it overpowers more often than 3%, because I think, it, it, I don't know exactly how it works, but it, it overpowers like 10% of the time. You know, there's like some lucky hit mechanics in the works and all that. I don't know exactly how it works, but basically, when I normally deal damage with it, it hits for like 40 damage, 
And when I overpower it, because the overpower damage is based on my health and fortify effect, it hits for about 600, but it hits 10 times. So we're talking about a skill that randomly hits 15 times harder every now and then. Just as an example, I don't have faith that they're going to balance the game appropriately because of the complexity at high level, and I certainly have zero faith that it's going to work out for PvP after that with like all the randomness and all that. In terms of fairness, I think PvP is going to be, is going to be a mess. But there is a zone with PvP uh, as part of the world, so I don't know how incentivized or forced that will be on its players, but I doubt it's going to be a particularly good experience for most of the players in it. The big unknown at the end of all this is the end game loop. I think that is what really sells the game for the ages. How fun is it to play this game for many hours, for many months, for many years, and in case of Diablo 2, for many decades? And that is not something that we know. And that is something that is really defining of, of a game, that is really defining of its success among its most hardcore players, its most enthusiastic players, at least. And that is something that we don't know. But a lot of the systems I talk about, I think makes the end game a real wild card. I hope I've convinced you guys of my original thoughts. I think a lot of the base systems can work out really well. I think there's a lot of really cool things about Diablo 4. But I think almost all of them need some tweaking. And the overall sum of that tweaking, I don't think can be done in two and a half months. But again, again, the beta that we're playing, we don't know how old that is. That might be where they were with the game six months ago. Who knows, right? So, I don't know what we're going to get on day one, but if the beta that we're playing right now is fairly current with where the development of the game is, I think it will be not all that great of a game on launch. Of course, with a lot of factors, one of which, how much they're going to put into the game until that time. Thank you for watching this very long video. I hope I've convinced you that I'm pretty good at these type of games. And maybe you got some member berries off Crip talking about Diablo for a change. Thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the videos. Take care.